Hey everyone, it's Amy and Ben here to chat again. Hey. We're from Lounge Room Empire, where we're conquering the world one armchair at a time. So, after much anticipation, mm-hmm. Carnival Row has finally graced our screens through yeah. Amazon Prime. Uh, we'd been hyped for this one uh, and counting down the days, uh, and we watched the first episode and thought we'd give you guys our immediate reactions. Yeah, and just to give a bit of context as well, we've been really excited about it. It's not in the way that like people keep thinking it's the next Game of Thrones. No, I mean, no, not at all. nothing is the next Game of Thrones. And I, it gets me really irritated when people say, oh, this is going to be the next Game of Thrones. Or everyone's looking for the next Game of Thrones. Yeah, I view Blood Moon's the next Game of Thrones because it's like in the Game it's of the Thrones. It's the closest yeah. Yeah, thing. Whether or not it's terrible, whether or not it's epic, it's yeah. the next Game of Thrones. Whereas everything else, like Wheel of Time and stuff, let it be the Wheel next, of Time. Yeah, the next fantasy thing. Yeah. yeah, or just like oh. let it be on its own merit. Like just stop it. Yeah. And just focus on doing good TV shows because the whole point of Game of Thrones and why it worked its way into so many people's hearts was not because of the White Walkers, was not because of the Night King, was not necessarily just because of Jon Snow, not necessarily just because of Daenerys. Essentially, great characters, great story, great script writing, great source material, rich, in depth looks beautiful on screen yep. and there's you know complexity to it like we'll do away with season eight potentially season seven as well yep. but the rest of it was gorgeous and not yeah. because of any particular fantasy element of it so don't keep trying to to find the next big fantasy epic let it be what it is now on that the reason that i'm trying to give context here is because the reviews that have come out about carnival row have been most first and foremost a little bit Dampening. Flat. Yeah, they've been quite flat. And the thing to call out is the critics' review is quite flat. The mm. audience review is actually quite high. Mm. And this is the inverse that we've seen with a couple of um, uh, movies and TV shows that we've recently watched um, before. The one that comes to mind is in Midsummer, yeah. where it was the other way around. And more and more, I think, yeah, we've caught out a number of videos that critics, it feels like they're getting it wrong. They're looking for things that are quite different. Um, and I'm more and more feeling that the audience review is actually. Um, Closer to the mark. Yeah. But look, you know, we're about two minutes in. I feel like we should probably start talking about Mm -hmm. Carnival Row. Mm -hmm. And and to kick it off, I love how this looks. It looks delicious. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mentioned before when I saw the trailer, I was really surprised in the quality of the fairy wings. Yeah. And it really brings that to life here. Because the way the fairy wings are on these guys' backs, it's almost like it's a little cloak for them. And I think that lends itself to... Um, they're wearing it as a cloak because they're not able to really let their wings shine. So in this um, city, the Berg, yep. uh, the area yeah, of the, capital, of yep, the of England, the Republic. Yeah, wherever it is, I think it's maybe in a different world. It is in a different is, world, yeah. Yep. I think they're like actually in the 7th century, even though it looks as if it's kind of Victorian. 17th century, I think. Yep. Oh, okay, yeah. I thought yep. it was, they actually call it the 7th oh, yes. century. So they are in um, their 7th century. And I thought it was Victoriana um, stuff. Yeah, so, well, whatever has so happened, 18... um, just to get the setting, yeah, right, is that, yes, it is um, in the, it's within the Industrial Revolution time for for them, military technology, they have guns, machine guns, they've got ships, um, they've got some type of, like, uh, steam uh, rails and things like that mm-hmm. as well, and ironclads, so steamboats that yeah. are in iron. Yeah, so... Um... The whole point with the Berg being a particular area is that it seems that the Fae have been taken over by um, the Pact, which is a a particular area or um, group of people who are humans. And the Fae have uh, become a bit of an underclass that are forced to kind of live in pretty much a a hell for them where they're the real working class to poverty-stricken people and forced to do things like prostitution or work as housemaids and slaves, etc., yep. for the rest of the classes. Yep. Um, and part of that, the wings on these guys, is that they're, they're almost like you're wearing hoodies, that they're a little bit ashamed of them, they're very flat. But when they come to life, and when Cara Delvin's character, Vignette Stone Moss, I think is her yep. name, when she actually uh, re- rebels and tries to save fairies and stuff like that, which she does very early on in the episode... It's just the most beautiful thing. Yeah. And 
I don't know why they don't do fairies more often. If they can do urban fantasy like this, then it should be on the screens more and more. And I don't know whether this is a result of the original work that came out that this um, TV series is based on yep. or whether it's something that they've added in. But the whirring of the wings is yes. really quite beautiful as I'm well. I'm really positive about that. So I, I think um, a key one for coming into this was going to be how they portray fairies or mm. the fae. Um, usually, my, my view is that they're not really done well. Mm. Um, they're usually quite more reserved for, for kids shows and things like that and it's more and, surface elements yeah and there's a level of impracticality so particularly with the wings and i think to your point they've done it quite well and how mm. they fall back down on the back mm. um because if they're just uh, if they're quite fixed um like they usually do it's impractical to walk around it seems a little bit silly um so i, I quite like that and the other one that kind of comes to mind but they had a slightly different take was how um true blood portrayed fairies in the mm -hmm. later seasons as well I like that. I thought the key for me was how the wings actually sound, as, as silly as that sounds. Because if it's got this, you know, we no sound or like this very high pitch. It, it, or twinkles or something. Yeah, it takes away a lot of the seriousness to it. But the whirring, it's, it, I, I like it. It's a, it's a bit darker. It sounds a bit menacing as well. It, the thing I found quite interesting, if I, if I can just keep going, is that um, when, when we have that opening scene and they're running away from the packed um, soldiers... Mm. My, I think the thing that I called out immediately, I was like, why aren't they flying? Yeah. Uh, and I think that goes to that subjugation that you were kind of talking yeah, about. Yeah, I immediately felt like I knew why they might not do, yeah, like, do that. Yeah, because the thing that I found really... Um, and and that's, that probably speaks to how long that war has been going, how long they've been subjugated. Because you got Kara's character, um, Vignette, comes in. She kills one of those dog things. She's flying. And then when she... Um, eventually escapes and all the people that she was trying to help escape get killed and she jumps off the cliff and activates her wings she flies a lot faster than she was running mm. like i mean she's covering a lot of ground really quickly which is a bit crazy when you think about it because if you want to get away from them, you want to do it in the fastest way possible but, but it just speaks to the psychology of how repressed they and are and i think that's what's so good about this tv series yeah, in, that, yeah. in that the opening scene automatically makes you think the, I know why these fairies aren't flying. It's because they they've been prey for so long. They've been trodden downtrodden by yeah. these other guys. These other guys have um, menacing power and aggression. And because the fae don't appear to be um, menacing and aggressive by nature themselves, they have allowed whatever power they might have and whatever power they might have in a pack. You can imagine that one fairy by itself might not necessarily be too scary. Imagine what they could do if they all were able to fly and understood their true power and i think that's what's so amazing about yeah. this that you automatically are set up with them forgetting who they are it's that learned, and, yeah, it's and that just learned, being afraid it's that learned helplessness mm. um that they not, up. yeah and not being able to use their wings in um in direct uh mirroring of cara del Vigne's character who refuses to um, be downtrodden and, yeah. re and rebels and still retains the power behind her wings. And yeah. we see that straight away. And yeah, a lot of this is going to be um, grabbing onto, you know, you know Industrial Revo Revolution time, particularly in the UK, given that that's kind of like the, the faux setting mm. for this one, but of the working class, how downtrodden and helpless they feel, despite the fact that they overwhelmingly um, make up the majority of society and that you know you always have that psychological element of you know if you're the majority in terms of um in terms of people power particularly in those times why are you being subjugated by the elite minority and it's not like you know 49 51 percent minority we're talking about you know the real the the top of the pyramid is really small and the base is really big mm. and so you know that is i think going to be the the discussions and it'll be interesting to see if they kind of tap on you know um what was kind of kind of happened around the industrial revolution times here with um, marxism and communism mm -hmm. um and and just more um more of a broader push for for representation and a say in in how society is governed and i suppose the dissemination of power potentially through force if not through rational reasoning and and slow movements but i think that's so we've got as well that kind of touch on that the leadership so you've got the chance we've got our favorite lane from um yeah from so lane, lane's lane's been busy these last couple of years he's doing the expanse yeah he's, he's leader of the belters yeah and then suddenly he's um done something else as well that uh we've been watching recently but i can't remember i'm like oh there's lane again yeah, yeah. lane's just picking it up and another person who uh, i think does a really um fantastic 
uh, portrayal in this one and we can talk about it in later episodes simply because um, there are a couple of things that happen in the storyline that, that shows up this character better than in the first episode. Yeah. But Indira Varma, yeah. I think. Uh, so she, the first time I saw Indira was in uh, Rome. Yep. She was playing Niobe, uh, which I think is a fictional character or otherwise. Whatever she did, she brought herself to it. And I think since then, I've really considered her to be an amazing actor. And I'm so glad to see her in this show because she really plays quite a complex character that I'd prefer to talk about later on because yeah. there are spoilers. Um, but just the the types of people who are playing in this show, I think they're all bringing acting chops to it. Yeah. The, problem, the, uh, the problem that I see that uh, I think the critics are not fixing on properly, that they're seeing that it's too busy. <laughs> to me, the show is just busy enough I it's think, just yeah. busy enough in terms of design it's it's the perfect mix of like that antique type shop yep. where there's so much of that filigree and damask wallpaper and stuff and everything's clashing because you want to show your wealth and because there is an emphasis on art and deco design and things yeah. like that i yeah i think it's a really good point because what i got from it was that it feels um crowded because it's meant to feel crowded. Like, I yeah. think this is all actually... What the critics are probably um, saying that, you know, it feels bloated and things like that. I think it feels blo- It feels full because it's meaning to be full. Yeah. Like, that's part of the feeling that it's, me- it's meant to be overcrowded. It's meant to be people stepping on each other, particularly the, you know, the, the melting pot of classes. And in this, you know, um, uh, what would you call it? Species mm. that don't want to get along. You're meant to be feeling that tension being raised by being too close to each other. Yeah, and the, and the dainty teacup starting to rattle because yeah. you're just like jostling for a position in this society. Completely. I think it's perfectly set up for that sort of stuff. But what I think the critics maybe aren't quite noticing that is a little bit of a weak point, particularly in the pilot episode, is that I don't feel like the script writing has settled in for the actors themselves. So part of the problem, for example, when Kara... Kara's character vignette first comes across a Croft, across, across Rycroft Philostrate, who yep. is kind of her ex lover, yep. um, who is like a, yeah, a human and yep. um, doesn't uh, doesn't agree with the same human treatment of the Fae, and he's actually trying to investigate certain situations. So I think he's some somewhere he's, in the crime force. He's a, yeah, force. he's a, he's a um, private investigator. No, or no, he's an actual cop. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's uh, I forget the name of, but yeah, he's like. Um, like a detective. A yeah. Detective. So, so when they talk to each other and when they have that interaction, I would have preferred a little bit less, uh, not comprehension. What's the word? Exposition. Yeah. A little bit less explanation. They don't need to say you left me seven years ago. Blah blah blah. Say li- we already know that there's something that's gone down wrong, and I yeah. don't want to see what uh, everything played out in the first episode. And I feel like a lot of the time through the episode itself that the speeches that the actors are saying to each other are actually really well written they're just not quite understanding it in its entirety i don't and i think that could just be that as the actors spend more time together as the actors uh, understand what's happening with their characters and interacting with other characters as it goes along in the series they get more understanding of their own character and they can start talking unlike it feels like it's someone who's just tried to read Shakespeare off a plate, yeah. off a page, and I not known what it actually means. I, I, I agree in terms of um, what it is. I, the only disagreement I have is is why. And I think this is a, really a criticism of actual pilots. Hmm. Um, so in a pilot, they're do, trying to do so much, and there's so much exposition. I think the, the industry kind of needs to do away with the one episode pilot. Hmm. They really need to take you know. Um, or advocate our view on it that you really need three episodes or something to, to get a sense and so what that allows is if you have three episodes you don't need to ex- go into um, the first episode you don't need to tell the audience mm. why you're doing something yes. and who someone is you can show because you've got a bit more larger because if they tried to show all that stuff the episode would be way too crammed and would be so incoherent yes. um, so they try to do it by you know just a couple of lines and I think that's why it feels a little bit stilted because they're saying things that these characters don't feel like they should be saying or would say. Mm. And so that's why the conversation feels a bit weird. I just, I just feel like the, the actual script itself is actually really yeah. good. Well, I view that, yeah, a lot of this stuff is maybe the script having that information. However, um, one thing, you know, a side note, 
I thought Orlando's really good in this. I'm not usually not Orlando. I know people keep saying he's he's bad at acting, but I don't think he is. I don't think that he's bad acting. I've just never really been a fan. Mm. Um, or, you know, all, for my person, all he's ever really done he's, is he's done Troy and he's done Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, but I think he's really good. He looks good being um, a bit more roughed up. Yes, and I agree. Up. He suits that part really well. I think well. he's grown up a little. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a really good role for him. And I think it's funny because maybe it's because of his personal life. I can totally see him with Cara Delvine. Maybe because he's had Miranda Kerr for so many years yeah. that this is like a similar supermodel type yeah. person. But it just makes sense. But yeah. I think that's the other thing. The other characters, like for example, um, I can't think of what her name is, but the prostitute friend who's tourmaline tourmaline yeah. yeah beautiful names i love how their names like signify who they are so she's yeah. got the tourmaline colored hair and it's it's just really pretty i think what the thing is is how they portray the fairies how they portray um the centaurs and the other yeah. types of hybrids that are in this series is that it's more than just skin deep their, yeah. their wings are more than just skin deep their horns are in their head yeah, like it's, it's part of them. Not it's like... part of them. It's not just on top of them. Yeah. And there's certain little aspects like the colored hair or like the way that they do their makeup that just kind of tell you something about who they are rather yeah. than just being, well, I'm this species, you're that species, and, and that we're really just the same species. They're completely yeah. different. Yeah. And I just think that works so well here. And I think the actors just do such a good job of... Um, portraying those different species yeah, as well completely i completely agree um I, i'm interested as well so you know that there's always that um uh, overarching political movement as well like mm. you know the people that want um to unify the society the people that want to keep them separate i like that that was touched on um but didn't um make feel like a big part of it mm. it seems like we're, we're more at the coal face of it the thing i um the thing I did want to quickly talk about, though, was at the end yes. of the episode. So, um, you know, we're chasing this kind of Jack the Ripper style character that seems to kill a fairy, uh, or, uh, you know, one of the critch, so one of the magical creatures, every three weeks. And our man, Orlando, he tracks down the guy, figures out that it's a sailor. Um, I like kind of um, what he was saying. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. One that he kind of killed himself. So you're saying what Orlando said about the guy? No, what the guy was saying, like, I like that kind of hype that build up that, you know, these creatures have brought more than just themselves. They've brought their dark gods mm -hmm. with them and something's going to happen. Yeah. So one, I was like, well, how the hell did this sailor mm. come across this information? Like, this seems like a pretty big deal. Yeah, it but, sounds like he's the Oracle kind of speaker, Yeah, but he? why would you just then off yourself? Because it looked like Orlando was going like, wait, hang on a second. What, 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 are, you, what are you talking about? He seemed to, one, you know, have him cornered, but then become really engaged um, in what was going on. So it felt a little bit weird that he then just kind of offed himself because I thought that there's a little bit more that can kind of go there. Mm -hmm. Unless they wanted to make it more ranting, it probably should have felt a bit more ranting, a bit more craziness in the guy, and that's why he kills himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the comment that you made at the time was then at the end when um, that poor fairy lady gets captured by that tentacled beast, mm -hmm. that they do the full overlay of that guy's speech again. And it felt, I think you said, it felt a little bit too um It felt la laboured, yeah. yeah. It felt as if we as the audience, I knew there was some, like, I think it, it stood, I think there's two things to note here. One negative, and I'll say that first, and one really positive about the series the negative aspect is again it, it's like the script hasn't settled in for the characters they don't need to say at the end uh, a repeat of what the guy said halfway the, through yeah because, and my view was not the full not the full speech i could have even just but i knew sentence. straight away that 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 scene was referring back to that guy because he he said it so ominously and it didn't sit in any other aspect of the pilot episode so i knew that that guy was talking about something ominous that was probably going to come out at maybe at the end of the season and then when you have this complete switch of this isn't about the fae versus humans this is about something deeper and darker underground that is killing the fae yeah. once that comes out i'm like there's the dark god this is a creature that's pretty huge that guy that was saying it and then they do the overlay of the dark god speech from the guy and i was like you don't need to say that that's labored However, I would. Did you want to say something? The only thing about I'd that? say that is that I agree for us, but there are a lot of people that you know. With, with these shows, you can only go as fast as the slowest person, and so there are a lot of people that miss a lot of things with these types of shows. So 
Although well, I don't agree with the um, execution of it, I understand why. I understand why. I don't agree that they should that they did it, but I don't understand why they did. I understand why they did. I just don't think they should. So to me, you don't go as slow as the slowest person. You say, "Sorry, audience, if you're slow, too slow to understand this, it's not for you. This is for a better audience. This is for a more interested audience who understands those particular things." And I think there's enough people out there in the world now who have access to Amazon Prime, who would be able to give a real good fan base to this, who doesn't need to be told every single thing in that show and tell style. So look, audience elitism <laughs> aside. Um, <laughs> You and I have different views on this. We were talking about it before. The whole point is um, for these type of shows. My view is that these are commercial advent, uh, commercial ventures. Sometimes adventures. Yeah, sometimes adventures. So these are to to make money and to be popular um, with the audience. So that means that they need to understand. So you know, even when we think of Game of Thrones again, which is wildly popular, but there was there were a lot of people that didn't realize, for example, that we saw Rhaegar. They thought that it was uh, Viserys. Um, they didn't realize that Rhaegar was Viserys and Daenerys's brother. So again, uh, no to, comment. Yeah, I but think that but, says it all. But but again, so these people aren't looking to appeal to a couple of people so that they really enjoy it. It's the same kind of view is that you have when people um that you know where there's a what there's a long history with um a source material, and then they make something into a, a TV show or, or movie. As much as um, you know, the, the loyalty of those fans is important, they're not making it a TV show for those fans. They're making it for the people that have never seen it before. I don't, I don't, I don't think we're disagreeing on that point. I think um, it's slightly but, different. Well, my other point, sorry, just to cover up, is that mm -hmm. this again is, I believe, more symptomatic of the episode being a quote-unquote pilot I episode. Agree. So again, with, I think the, the issue is with pilots. So... It's not that there's an issue with the with the writing or the actors. They're doing this because they need exposition to cover off enough background in one episode to get the studio executives interested and bought into the concept. Yeah, sure. But you did have a positive point that you want to raise on this. Yes, I, I'll try to remember something positive. No, I really liked how this isn't about the Fae versus the humans. Yes. There's a number of different political structures here and nothing is as it seems. And that's where I start to see that this TV show could go to a lot of different places if it gets its footing. And once it does, I'm going to be loyal to it to see where it goes. And I think that's why Amazon has gone out on a limb before this has been released and says, let's give them the money now for season two so they can start work on it. Now that you start to understand the, the feel of the show and the characters, we won't keep you um, in suspense of whether or not you're going to get another season. You get another season now to better refine and polish your material and have enough time and lead up to do it. And the fan base will grow and I hope it grows the way The Expanse grew where the first couple of episodes, no one really gets into it and then suddenly it just kind of starts exploding and then exploding a bit more and then by the second and third season we're going off into worlds you would never have expected that's yeah. what i'd like to see here yeah it might yeah. be a bit ambitious but no i think timing timing is the key um here too so you know it's similar like we were just i was just saying in relation to a pilot episode when you tell um you know a production company potentially it was a little bit too late but that they've got at least two seasons they can start playing with two seasons as the pacing they don't yeah. have to look to kind of potentially have wrapped things up in one season. Yeah, and so, I think, we, were we saying with this particular one that we'd like to see it uh, stretch out a little bit over the episode? That it, some of the things are a little bit too quick and similar to the way Game of Thrones is actually quite stretched out and l languished over the episode, that we'd like to see how these things kind of play out a little bit longer? Was uh, that this show or was that another show we were talking about? Uh, no, recently? so the only thing that, that I was saying, so one, again, um, I keep reiterating, um, but I think it's important that this is a pilot episode, so I don't take it as um, as uh, typifying the, yeah, of the pacing of episodes and mm -hmm. seasons. Um, the one thing that I did say after watching this is I hope that they have a similar approach to the pacing that shows like The Expanse use, where it appears that the episodes just aren't paced in a certain way, but the season is paced in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, there is big setup and then there is a, you know, an escalation or a building of momentum as things, all these um, various threads start coming together. Yeah. And that's something that I really enjoyed about The Expanse. I think that what everyone really enjoys about The Expanse that watches it and why it's so highly regarded is the way that they weave the story, that the episodes don't feel like they have, one, that they kind of stand alone, but also in a weird way as well, that they aren't kind of just following one from the other, like, you know, oh, 
episode one was Tuesday, episode um, two was Wednesday, episode three was Friday, that there is a different perspectives and different parts that need to be played and to be played out to then make up that cohesive season that is actually one big story, not just a, you know, a storyline. Absolutely. Agree with you there. I think uh, as final thoughts for this one, summing it up, it's funny that we watch this show in conjunction with um, the other big one on Netflix at the moment, which is the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. They've got similar style. Um, you know, they're both focused on a kind of fey type creature with beautiful uh, renderings of landscapes and stuff. Even though that one is more of a polished atmosphere, whereas this one's a little bit more higgledy piggledy, perhaps both in the way it's meant to be and also in the way that it doesn't have uh, amazing Jim Henson and, and Netflix huge amounts of money and artistic creations behind it i feel more that i want to sink my fingers into the soil of this one other than that one yeah interesting um sink your fingers into the soil i just feel like it's 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 actually no i think i feel like it's it's quite dirty it's quite like i want to see where this goes and i want to put my fingers down into the soil and see how it kind of feels Okay. I don't know do how you do to that a lot, that. like when I'm not home? Or... Maybe. Um, I yeah, but uh, I agree where you end up. I, I think the only, I, I view that this act that um, Carnival Row has higher production quality and, yeah. and, and investment. I think the only. Um, Crikey. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that. Um, wow. But, yeah, I, I think I, I think that's born out of how it looks and feels. So I, I can feel that a lot of work has been put into this particularly you don't think that with dark crystal i think a lot of work's been put into dark crystal i feel that more has been put into this one wow yeah um particularly given how they shoot the scenes and the location so Mm -hmm. um you know again i want to finish i'm really excited for come row i'm feeling really positive about it and i can't wait to watch the next episode me too so guys let us know what you think in the comments below um are you a big fan of what you've seen so far with come row and how did you feel about this episode as as a quote-unquote pilot versus you know is episode one of season one Mm. let us know in the comments below why they hit like hit subscribe and we will see you next time bye